La Trobe University acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. My name's Catherine Itziopoulos, and I'm the Head of School of Allied Health and a Professor of Dietetics at La Trobe University. On behalf of the university, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second Bold Thinking Series panel discussion for 2018. There, there will be six other Bold Thinking events held this year in the city and in regional areas where our campuses are located. Now, I've been a dietitian for many years, and it's absolutely fascinating to me to see the rising popularity of plant-based food diets, along with an increasing number of people choosing veganism, both in Melbourne and uh, parts all over the world. Now, I've spent many, many years uh, researching um, diet, traditional diets that are plant-based diets, so it, this topic is very close to my heart. Tonight's discussion will consider why people make this choice and how it relates to their sense of identity, as well as the psychological and sociological aspects of diet and food choice. We will explore questions like, what is the deeper meaning of food in life? Why do people change their diet? And what are the five major domains of food? On tonight's panel, we have Dr. Joanna McMillan, welcome, who is, who is an honorary senior research fellow at La Trobe University. Originally from Scotland, Joanna came to Australia in 1999, qualified with a Bachelor of Science with first class honours in nutrition and dietetics. She then won a scholarship to complete her PhD with the University of Sydney, which she was awarded in 2006. Joanna has extensive media experience as a health presenter. She is a regular on the Today Show and currently a presenter on um, ABC Catalyst. Joanna is also an accomplished author, having published several books on nutrition and health, including her latest, Get Lean, Stay Lean, and runs her own website, drjoanna.com.au. And I know you love vegetables and plant-based diets, Joanna. Joining her is Dr. Matthew Ruby, a psychology lecturer. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Psychology lecturer at La Trobe University. Originally from rural Maine, Matt obtained his PhD in psychology from the University of British Columbia in 2012. He was a visiting researcher at the Universitat Hamburg and the Universitat Constance and completed his postdoc fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania with Paul Rosen, a world leading expert in psychology of food and eating. Matt has published extensively on the psychology of food choice with a focus on how people decide which animal foods are acceptable to eat, the tension many people feel between loving animals and loving meat, cultural differences in veganism and vegetarianism, and the factors that support and hinder people's transition to a plant-based diet. Our third panelist is Maureen Mo Wise. <laughs> Welcome, Mo. <laughs> Mo is a Seattle and New York expat. She studied journalism, has a background in production and events management, but has dedicated her passion for creative plant-based food to creating Smith & Daughter's Restaurant and Smith & Deli, where she is the logistics or logistical front of house marketing brains behind the gun uh, team with chef Shannon Martinez. Their first cookbook, Smith & Daughters, a cookbook that happens to be vegan, by the way, uh, of course, launched in November 2016, is currently in its fourth printing and has been shortlisted in numerous industry and design awards, as well as translated into Dutch, which is great. Their second book, Smith and Delicious, a deli that happens to be vegan, uh, is due for release in November 2018. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, Richard Cornish. Applause again, please. <laughs> an an award-winning food writer and author whose love of the land led, led him to explore the issues around food, where it, come from, where it comes from, how it gets to us, and why some foods taste better than others. He's a senior features writer for the Fairfax Good Food and Epicure Liftouts, and is the writer and creator of its popular Brain Food column. He's the author of My Year Without Meat, and has co-written four books on Spanish food with Movida chef Frank Camora, 
and worked in Mexico researching and photographing a book on Mexican food culture. Richard appeared on the Australian version of Iron Chef and was co-creative director of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival and continues to consult the organisation. I will now hand over to tonight's host, broadcaster, journalist, writer, Francis Leach and the panel. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight. And for those who are watching via Facebook Live, because we're also uh, going out live uh, on that platform tonight too. So we're going to have a conversation for about an hour here and then we'll throw it open to questions as well. So it should be uh, a fantastic uh, hour and a bit spent with you talking about this very important issue. Ma, I'm going to start with you. I have just landed on planet Earth. I don't know anything about veganism. Explain to me, what is it? Veganism at the basis is partaking in a lifestyle that doesn't contain any animal products whatsoever. Nothing that you eat, nothing that you wear, nothing that you participate in entertainment-wise, nothing. And yes, even cheese comes from an animal. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> Matthew, it's growing in popularity, there's no doubt about it. And the fact that we've got a room full of people here tonight who are interested in this topic. Why do you think now's the time that it's become a more prevalent issue? Ooh, so that's a complicated question to answer. There's, I think, a lot of factors that are contributing to this. Uh, on the one hand, there's increasing public knowledge about the way that meat and other animal products are produced. There's a lot of very popular documentaries that are capturing the public's attention, a lot of activity on social media. At the same time, there's a lot of really exciting innovation in the food sector. So um, there are companies like Impossible Foods that are creating a plant-based burger that bleeds because of beet juice that's in it that mimics actual meat really well. There's Just Incorporated who are doing egg type things like a scrambled egg that's made entirely from plant products, uh, like a mayo that's entirely plant-based. Uh, and then there's a lot of really fantastic innovations in the restaurant scene as well. So Smith & Daughters, of course. Um, and then back in Philadelphia, uh, Veg is the top-rated restaurant by Zagat for the past several years running, and it just happens to be entirely vegan, and it's beat out all the other restaurants, whether they're serving animal products or not. So I think just people are thinking a lot more about where their food comes from. It's much easier to eat vegan food, and it's a lot more exciting and varied than it used to be. That being the case, it's still relatively new, Joe, and I, I guess it, in the wider community, the idea of being vegan. Vegetarianism is certainly something that has been with us in, say, contemporary Australian culture for a little, in my living memory. I mean, my auntie was a vegetarian in the, in the 70s, and that was a pretty radical step back then, but it's much wider now. But why do you think that it seems to be increasing in popular? Is it about access to the availability uh, and the tools to be able to make that choice? Well, yeah, I think a lot of, I mean, we have to remember that veganism in Australia is still a very small number. We're, yeah. we're talking, Do we know? Uh, it's something like less than 5%. We have a slightly higher range of, of vegetarianism, but there is this rising interest. We do know a vegan diet is one of the most Google search diets mm -hmm. um, in Australia. So there's obviously a lot of interest there. I think you're right. I think part of it is people traditionally haven't grown up with that kind of a diet. They've got no idea how to put together a vegan meal. Um, I know a lot of youngsters have been brought to me saying, well, you know, I want to go vegetarian, all they've done is cut out meat, not replaced it with anything. And then you're going to end up with a diet that's deficient in lots of things. So yes, I think in part it's become popular. Vegan recipes are becoming more available, obviously from people like Mo. So people are becoming more familiar with that kind of food and understanding what they might be able to do with it. In terms of nutrients, I mean, can yeah. you have the full range of nutrients? Can you satisfy what your, what your body would expect if you have a plant-based diet? Or? Well, it's obviously possible because people can be vegetarian, but I've got to say a, a vegan diet is very difficult to get ex exactly right and lots of people make some mistakes and the longer that you are vegan the, the, the harder it can get. So there are some nutrients. Vitamin B12 is, is only found in, in animal foods. Um, long chain omega-3 fats. We have a limited capacity to turn plant omega-3s into long chain omega-3s. So there are some nutrients and, and things like iron and zinc, although you get these things in plant foods, they're far less absorbed. And so while most adults can 
drink open if you're careful with how you put together a vegan diet. And if you are considering going vegan, I would say see a dietitian to help you with how to put that kind of a diet together. But there are some concerns, particularly for children and particularly ch young children who are still growing. Um, and, you know, teenage girls, that concerns me. Can they really, I spoke with a GP the other day who says she's got a rise and, and youngsters being brought to her who are anemic because they're not meeting iron requirements because they've decided to go vegetarian or vegan. So there are some nutrition concerns there. So there's an idealism around veganism, which is based in, I guess, the philosophical choice to do good in the world, but it does present problems, Richard. Um, it does. Uh, the choice, the choice, f for me, the, uh, the, the philosophical choice, the veganism for me is one of the most purest and, uh, and most logical forms of ethics um, I have seen. Uh, if anyone who has, I, I grew up on a farm, right? So I grew up on a farm and we saw, we would kill our own anim animals. We would kill our animals to feed our family. We didn't have a lot of money. And so we'd have an animal, would, uh, a cow, that was uh, well looked after and uh, would feed it. And we would um, call its name up and then... Microphone's not working. Microphone's not working. We might... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. One, one. There we go. Guys, sorry about that, folks. Let's go kind of recap. Where were we? Okay. <laughs> You're Francis, living on the farm. Right, so we grew up on a farm. Yeah. Uh, we, we didn't have a lot of money. We used to kill our, an, our, our own animals to feed ourselves. Uh, our cattle, for example, would put a bale of hay down. Um, it would be eating, would call its name up, and then a man with a 22 would put a bullet through its head, and it would be dead in that instance. I'm really happy to eat that meat. I have been to abattoirs, and I have seen animals that thrash about knowing they're about to die. They can smell the blood of the animals before them. They have sensed that. They know what's going on. They're sentient animals. And when you see an animal's eyes roll back in its head knowing it's about to die, only the least sociopathic human being would not have empathy at that point and even to the point of being ill uh, with rejecting that scenario so you know there is a choice there's there's a whole lot of various scenarios within that that happens around an animal's death but then there are also a whole lot of people who have different levels of empathy as well mm -hmm. and and so you know there's some people who are sociopaths who don't really mind killing animals you know so then people actually enjoy it uh, I don't think there are many in the room tonight somehow. <laughs> um, and, um, but, then, uh, but then there are people who are really, really empathetic uh, and who cannot even uh, you know, withstand um, hurting a cockroach. And so in that, there's a whole lot of connections that can be made to do a whole uh, spectrum of ethics. And where you sit on that, I respect for, for anyone who makes the decision a thoughtful decision on where they sit on that spectrum of ethics. Have you made that decision f for life? Um, for yourself, or is it an evolving? I am looking position? forward to the day where I can eat the meat that we grew up with, where an animal was killed without knowing it was going to die. Um, I, after I gave up meat for a year, like all the benefits, you know, weight loss, uh, cholesterol down, blood pressure down, etc. And but the thing it was, it was that a new understanding of the world of actually cooking to begin with, without using the crutch of animal mm -hmm. protein. When we get when I, when we can have animals that um, there, there's actually there's an island called Bornholm in in Denmark where they raise animals that have that are basically cattle that are wild and they're hunted but assassinated not hunted for fun or knowing they're going to die there are snipers that are sent out to kill these animals because that meat tastes the best because the animal is dead uh, without knowing it's going to die because there's a whole lot of chemical reactions that go on through stress that actually damage the meat so yes. I'd like to sit somewhere back where I was a child, where we just watched, like, there's darkness, you know, there's light and there's darkness once more. Uh, it's an interesting point that Richard makes is a, is a function of, of where your ethics sit along that, that continuum about how you decide what is right for you. But it seems to me that there's a binary choice in the wider conversation about being a vegan or not being a vegan. You're either in the club or you're out of the club. Why is that the case, Matthew? Oh, um, <clears throat> well, yeah, strictly speaking, the definition of veganism is pretty specific that, you know, either you're in or you're out. There is a lot of movement in what's being known as the flexitarian or the reducitarian space, though. So a lot of people are realizing that in terms of, you know, fewer animals dying, doing less damage to the environment, if they say half
have their meat consumption or quarter it or just eat meat a couple days a week, they're at least mitigating the amount of impact that they're having. It's not as big of an ask for somebody to go whole hog vegan, as it were. Uh, is it the ideal situation? Perhaps not, but in terms of lives saved and in terms of impact on the environment, if you can get you know, a thousand people to have their meat consumption versus getting, say, 10 to cut it out completely, the overall impact will certainly be greater, but, but yeah. Because Mo, you would see it all the time in your restaurant, wouldn't you? All the time, yeah. And I, I really struggle with the definition of veganism because for me, as a, a vegan, that I've, I've been vegan longer than I've been alive, which is, or sorry, than I've been not vegan. Wow. <laughs> I just defied science and gravity. <laughs> I'm longer than I haven't. So 18 years being vegan, I, I think it's really amazing that there's still people that have to put you in one box or another and mm -hmm. The conversation of I could be vegan, but I just can't give up. But it, you can. You can be vegan and not give those things up, and you're still making a difference. So I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. The loudest naysayer coming into the restaurant is the person that is the one that's singing the loudest praises on their way out. The person that says, "I'm I'm not going to be full. I'm going to have to stop at Macca's on the way home." Um, <laughs> what do you eat? They don't really say that to you in your restaurant. Do oh, they? they do. Oh wow! Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, you eat twigs and grass, probably a lentil here and there, and then they have this amazing meal that is, yes, about what you're putting back in, not what you're taking out. There's so much of that taking out and not putting back in, mm -hmm. but you have to put things back in. So we do that, and we see changes every single day in that dining room, and I think that, though, and those are the people. If I could eat this way, I could go vegan. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you don't actually have to eat at our restaurant every day. There, there are, I would argue, really simple ways to, to do that in your own home. And I think there's another sort of transition that needs to happen in that you don't have to think of yourself as vegan or not. Most of what you eat probably is vegetarian anyway if you're a meat eater. So, I mean, I, I just think also the divisive issue of the meat eaters that have to claim that meat is theirs and vegans and, and vegetables are theirs and it just, it doesn't have to be one way or another. I think the word veganism has a really strong stigma, and it's, it's almost a dirty word still. I think the fact that people know what veganism is in this year is, is a really great thing, big strides, but the fact that veganism is still a bit of a dirty word, if we could do away with it and just say, let's make more ethical choices, that's the answer. Yeah, but it's what you've talked about, we spoke about before, Jen, it's that the idea of a mixed diet, uh, and being able to increase the, I guess, the plant capacity within your diet mm. and still identify that with yourself making ethical choices without being uh, identifying as a vegan is something that people find. Yeah, well, difficult. look, absolutely. No one's going to argue with the ethics of someone who makes that decision to go mm. vegan. And I would have every respect for anyone who makes that decision to go. My message to people is that that Australians are not eating enough plant food at all. And so my but why message not? Why do you is think they're not? We're, well, I, 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 I wish I could really answer that question. I mean, only 7% of Australians in the last nutrition survey were eating enough, eating the recommended portions of veggies. So, you know, I think we have, we have slipped way too far down the junk uh, food road. Uh, we know that about a third of our kilojoules in that, that survey were coming from junk food mm. and alcohol. So, we, you know, we've slipped down the convenience road and we've stopped the sort of, even the traditional kind of meat and three veg that we used to have. So my message to people is all of us, whether you choose to be vegan or whether you're an, a, a, a meat eater, all of us need to eat more plant food. That's easy to say, isn't it? But I look at it from an economic point of view and say, for someone who grew up in a housing commission uh, community, that choice is a, is a function of affluence. So if I have money, I could choose to buy fresh vegetables or I can make that choice about organic mm. food because I have the capacity to. But if I'm struggling to pay my bills and my rent and feed my family, I'm going to go for the cheapest, easiest and quickest and most convenient foods. And Richard, that's not going to be vegan. So is veganism a function of affluence and in that sense something of an indulgence? I actually look at, look, look, uh, look at, the, look at your argument there, Francis, and say... Uh, we don't have a lot of money, therefore we're going to buy the cheapest. When we were growing up, and I imagine there's a lot of, I know Broad Meadows pretty well, and there, if you go to the backyards, there are a lot of, I'm going to use the word, can I use the word wog garden? Is it okay to say that? You just did. People who... <laughs> but I know what you mean. People who came to Australia, they, they came from 
they are really well cultured and they're really well educated in growing plants for to feed themselves and that was the economy of that household uh, we grew up in that we, we grow vegetables in our garden and I imagine a lot of your neighbors grew up um, and I think a lot of people in this room will remember people growing their own vegetables and people still growing their own vegetables to actually feed themselves and not because mm. it's on trend that is I reckon we've gone to a point now where we do not have that within our culture and so and we do not have that in our knowledge base and it's actually a de-skilling of h urban humans mm -hmm. I find that a real a real threat mm. to our society that we do not know how not just to feed ourselves but to grow the food to feed ourselves but in saying that um, is it uh, is it about affluence well if well if you it's you know what the f junk food that Joan has been talking about is so well designed to appeal to our base needs. It's sweet, it's fat, and it's got all these little bells and whistles. It's salty, and it's got this. It's really. It's like. It, it, it's like Baba to Abba. It's like it. It's an. It's a sats food. It's copying food, but it, it actually is a, a simulcrum. It's a, it's a, it's a copy of food. It is it is ghosting food. It is no longer real food anymore. But it's coming at a price point that people have to make those decisions. It's before. price and it's cheap and it's quick and it's available. And that's the difference for communities where they're time poor and resource poor. I'm going to challenge the price thing though because one of the best segments I ever did in the Today Show was when the producers rang me up and they said, hey Joe, can you do a segment showing us how to make some of the most common um, fast foods at home? And I said, yeah, sure. Now, do you want me to show you how to make it cheaper as well? And they said, can you do that? <laughs> I went, yeah, of course I can. I put the phone down. I thought, oh God, can I? <laughs> <laughs> and then I just put together my recipes and I just worked out the cost and I swear I, I, I didn't change any ingredients and it was cheaper than the fast food. Mm -hmm. So I do think Richard's got hit a really interesting point there that I talk about a lot, um, is that we, we've actually lost the skills of our grandmothers mm. as to how to budget for the family for the week, how to use the leftovers, how to make stock from the, the roast on the Sunday and then use that to make what we called stovies as a Scottish dish. Stovies, that stovies was the Monday night dish. What was, was stovies? The, so stovies is the leftover meat from the Sunday roast. You make, you use the gravy and you boil up potatoes. Nothing's wrong with potatoes, by the way. You can have potatoes as part of a healthy diet. And you use the meat and the gravy and the whatever, and it made up stovies and you ate it with oat cakes. And that was Monday night's dinner. And then the leftovers, the bones were boiled up and that made a stock. And then mum made a great big veggie soup. And yes, we also had a veggie garden and we grew the, the veggies that then went into that soup and so on. The the yep. week went. So I think we've kind of lost those skills and we're sold the mess. We're sold the line that we oh, we, we deserve not to cook, that mm -hmm. we deserve quick, easy food and that this food is cheaper. And in fact, it's not. Quickly, Richard, before we throw it. And I'll just go, uh, uh, go on price. Uh, there is uh, a line, you've heard the line, uh, of s s farmers markets are mm -hmm. for the, the, the wealthy and and white and the, the upper class. I went out and did, uh, did a comparative shopping uh, between the um, the market at um, in, in Sydney near Redfern and then went to the yeah. uh, the Woolies near the uh, the um, Rabbitohs um, uh, uh, home ground and went shopped food that was not on special and food that was just at the retail price lamb at the uh, farmers market was cheaper all the brassicas all the root vegetables were cheaper uh, at the farmers market uh, except for those that were on special at the supermarket and when we took them back we held them in the fridge and the food from the farmers market a tasted better and b lasted longer mm. so there are some myths to bust i guess in mm. all of this as well what do you think matthew that we this debate, what I'm fascinated with, it elicits such strong emotional reactions mm. from so, people. Happy to answer that. Just to quickly jump on the price thing as well, because this is something that comes up quite a bit yeah. in our work, is that there is this perception that veganism is only for something that are for people who are well off, who are wealthy. And yes, if you're buying the super fancy, you know, mock meats and mock cheeses, that are hyper-processed, but the basic staples, I mean, whole grains, lentils, chickpeas, that is so cheap and that's, I, it's just really affordable, so I don't so much buy that argument that it's, it's a matter of affluence. Uh, but in terms of the strong emotions, so there's a lot of things that come into play on both sides here. So for people who are eating meat who get really upset at the idea of vegans kind of forcing their views on them. Um, so for a lot of people, eating meat is a really important part of family traditions. Uh, it's associated with celebrations, with good times, things like the Sunday roast or the, or the barbecue. And 
they're very really reluctant to give up those sort of activities, those sort of memories that are associated with that. But at the same time, if we look into anthropology, humans have a long history of a really ambivalent relationship with meat. So in most cultures, meat is the most highly prized category of food, as associated with the most status and prestige, but it's often the most tabooed, the one that people are the most kind of uneasy about. So often slaughterhouses are kind of pushed to the outskirts of cities. People don't really want to know, for the most part, where their meat is coming from. People would probably much rather go on a tour of a chocolate factory than, say, a sausage factory. Mm -hmm. You can probably <laughs> guess why. Um, so, and there's quite a bit of research showing that just reading about vegans or vegetarians causes a lot of meat eaters to feel defensive and to increase their justifications for why they're eating animals than if you don't have them thinking about them. Uh, and that's part of what uh, some psychologists at Stanford have called do-gooder derogation. So the idea is that if somebody else is doing something that you think is a good thing on some level, but you yourself are not doing it, yes, you'll give them props, but you'll put them down in some other sort of aspect. So there's a lot of research showing that meat eaters, on average, perceive vegetarians and vegans as being very ethical and principled, but sentimental, weak, wishy-washy, kind of bleeding hearts. And this is directly related to how much they think the vegetarians are judging them mm -hmm. for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, even though the research shows that there's a lot less of that going on than people think. So that's, that's the one side of it. And on the vegan side, why so many vegans get really worked up and there's the stereotype of the angry vegan activist um, <laughs> is, I mean, we all know them. Some of us may have been them at some point. Uh, is that for a lot of vegans, uh, the decision is made on really strongly held ethical principles that we don't want to be killing or exploiting animals, that we want to reduce the amount of suffering that we're causing in the world. And for a lot of vegans, when you see meat, when you see people eating meat, you're very much reminded of the link between the meat and how it was made and how the animal probably died in most cases because most of them are going to abattoirs and not you know, getting assassinated on that Danish island. Um, <laughs> so don't go for a walk on that Danish island. You don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it can, it can very much be a reminder that you know, this is happening and you see people around you who are eating these products without any sort of visible concern for where that's coming from and that can be quite frustrating. So both sides uh, can get really quite heated about this and the two just kind of feed into one another. Not to mention your first argument which is why are you differentiating between animals you love and animals you eat? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really strong argument. Why are, yeah. why are dogs and cats so prized? Yes, people get really worked up when they find out that there's these cultural festivals in other countries where people are killing dogs and eating them and they're outraged and yet worse treatment is happening to animals on some factory farms with similar emotional capacities and oh well they're just raised for us to eat so mm, let's not worry about that. But food is also very much a function of cultural identity uh, and therefore uh, to tell someone that their, uh, their choice is wrong is to tell them that their culture is in some way inferior or wrong. And that can be really difficult. I mean, I've spent a fair bit of time in Brazil in recent years and mm -hmm. tell most Brazilians that they can't eat Brazilian barbecue and they, they will be very upset at you <laughs> suggesting that they are doing anything other than right. what is natural to a Brazilian. So um, I, I want to throw this open to the panel, but how do, you, how do you deal with issues of cultural identity where food is central to people's understanding of who they are and meat is at the center of that? For us, it's finding alternatives. So I am really privileged to be in a business relationship with a true creative chef who says, give me what your favorite family dish was, and she recreates it in, in, in almost sometimes, I'm sorry to say it, but better. And I say sorry because she made a better matzo ball soup than my grandma made. <gasps> sorry, grandma, but it's true. And, and that's the thing, There's, there is an alternative out there. I know I'm in a privileged position to have a personal chef to tell me, uh, what do you miss? What can I recreate for you? But there are alternatives out there for literally every single thing. And we've been interviewed far and wide about what, do you, what are you missing in your Christmas dinner? And do you have to have a roast at, the, at the, the middle of the table? And things, you know, I'm not saying that culture is wrong. Let's give them the Brazilian roast, but vegan version. Let's do it. John? Am I the only person who finds it a little bit odd that you would want to be a vegan but still think you're eating meat? Like, I find it odd that if, if, I, if you're going to choose to be vegan, why do you want a burger that pretends it's bleeding blood? Because it's got beetroot. I find that really odd. Vegans aren't going vegan because they don't like the taste of meat. Okay. Not all uh, of them. Yeah. Um, I reckon there's the um, uh, 
Here's a story for you. In the summer of 1968, a meteorite crashed down near Murchison, and the scientists from around the world scrambled to find that meteorite. And in it were organic compounds, as water, but there was also uh, amino acids. One of them was glutamic acid. And they went, walked away from this, and they decided this could be where life on Earth started. The building blocks of, of life itself could have come from outer space. Glutamic acid is one of those building blocks. Look, you, on your tongue, you've got sensors that are hardwired to detect salt, sugar, bitter compounds, um, sourness, and glutamic acid as well. It's quite, and it's delicious, it tastes delicious. Glutamic acid tastes delicious. And it's generally found uh, in our food source in and around meat. Also, uh, uh, there's other compounds called guanate and uh, anisinate, and they're found f around fish. We are hardwired to d discover deliciousness and deliciousness <laughs> around meat. It's part of our hardwiring. But culturally, we've been able to synthesize mm -hmm. or concentrate. The, let's just call that that thing deliciousness okay can, can we can we agree on that term deliciousness just building on your argument there before deliciousness we create that by taking milk and breaking it down uh, using uh, enzymes uh, produced by bacteria to make cheese and and during the Roman Catholic Church's uh, dominion over the Northern Hemisphere during the Dark Middle Ages, they had what four days and seven were um, days where you were had to fast. You weren't allowed to eat meat, and so all these cheeses, uh, washed rind cheeses, developed that were very very meaty. They're just full of glutamic acid. But the other way we create deliciousness in food is uh, who here's Italian or Spanish here? Um, sofrito. So frito, taking things, or like mirepoix in French, you take uh, your, uh, your carrots, your onions, your celery, uh, perhaps some tomato, you cook it down, and you cook it down and down and down and down and down and down. Just say there's 90 milligrams of glutamic acid in a tomato, in a, in a ripe tomato. If you dry it out, it becomes 160 gram milligrams. Um, per 100 grams. When you start reducing food down, you start reducing food down and making it more and more concentrated using these traditional cooking methods, you create deliciousness that is plant-based. It's plant-based deliciousness. And the funny thing is, can I just, the really, really funny thing is this, is that, um, that glutamic acid's really, really strong in, um, in mother's milk, particularly in colostrum. And I really find it funny that the mums of the house have got this link with their children, they, they give them deliciousness in their first couple of days, and then they continue to do that in, like, in traditional um, communities, when you have these beautiful dishes made with these cooked down um, beginnings of the dish, like sofrito and mirepoix, that they continue to hold the family together around the family dinner by offering them more and more deliciousness. <laughs> it is part of our very <laughs> own culture, and it is plant-based nutrition. And it's, even though it's cooked down, and then you add more vegetables, etc., to it. Mm -hmm. But you don't, there's really, a lot of those dishes don't really don't even require meat. So, there's a lot of this, as you've pointed out, everyone here has pointed out that the advantages and the, the, the blue sky for, for, for plant-based diets, but what we don't have is a dialogue across tribes. So we have vegans and people who identify as, as vegans or vegetarians and those who don't. What's the common ground in which we can share? Because if, if food is, is a function of identity and we are now in the age of tribal wars where people sort of coalesce around the tribe that they identify with and judge those that they are not, how do we start to build a common ground where both sides will listen to one another? Because it seems at the moment that that isn't possible. Matthew, we'll start with you and then we'll come yeah, yeah, across. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm very happy to kind of bounce back and forth <laughs> in the two of us as well. So I don't think that we need to be locked into a tribal warfare by any account. I think sometimes that happens and that's unfortunate. I think we probably have more in common than separates us in terms of what we're valuing. So we may be making very different decisions on what we're eating, but at the core of it, you know, most people really care about food. Food is a very meaningful part of their life. Some of our own research has shown that there are kind of five major domains of meaning that would be shared whether you're vegan or not. So uh, food has a very strong social meaning, so sharing food with others, making you feel closer with them, a very strong health meaning. So for a lot of people, eating foods that nourish them is a very meaningful activity. For a lot of people, uh, food has aesthetic meaning. So uh, eating a really well-presented meal or really creative meal is an artistic experience that people 
spiritual value. Uh, for a lot of people, there's a spiritual meaning involved in it as well. So whether they're following religious tenets or trying to reduce uh, the amount of harm that they're doing, etc. And, and the then there's the moral meaning, in and the rituals right. involved in that. So you have specific foods that are eaten at certain religious ceremonies, depending on one's culture, that are really important and integral to that, or certain religions avoid eating certain foods because of particular spiritual principles. And then there's the moral meaning of food, which is probably where the most sort of conflict happens. Um, but I think that there's probably going to be less of this conflict as time goes on because you can still have your delicious food that is like what you grew up with. It just happens to not be made from animals anymore. But I it really is think we're heading in that direction. It is a political battleground, isn't it? Yeah. If you go to one extreme where people might believe that uh, the animals on the earth were, were, were given to us uh, uh, to be under our dominion, to be used as, as we see fit, it's pretty hard to convince someone who's, whose belief system mm -hmm. is based in that that veganism is for them. I'd say that's extremely old school and like everything, I mean, it's the, for me, it's the people that don't believe in climate change, so, I mean, really, if you're saying that animals are here on the earth, then treat them the way that Richard's family treated them, don't put them in abattoirs. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the, the basic fundamental difference. I think there'd be a lot more consciousness around eating meat if animals were actually treated ethically, and, and that's what that animals on the earth argument and we hear it all the time as vegans mm -hmm. all the time but for me it and and for my physical capacity it's creating positive experiences and spaces mm -hmm. around veganism and I always say how do you do that how are you doing that at the moment? I'm doing it because you can walk into the restaurant and you have no idea you're in a vegan restaurant why do we have to put a definition on vegan restaurants must have slaughterhouse footage <laughs> and an angry hippie with dreadlocks giving you pamphlets at the door and veggie stacks. Like, why was that? Why? Why was that the manual to opening a place that serves plant-based food? I have mm -hmm. no idea. But some people, like I said before, have negative conceptions because mm -hmm. that was their one experience with vegan food. So if you create a, an environment that's unlike anywhere else, where a bustling Fitzroy restaurant that serves cocktails and great music and really great service that person can come in and be not confronted, not alienated, and yep. they can see that this plant-based diet is, oh, there's something to it. So I think it's all about positivity mm -hmm. and not alienating and, and making people feel like, why wouldn't I make, you know, and it's how Shannon creates food. Mm -hmm. If I can make roast beef and I can make a vegan roast beef and it's the exact same in flavor, why wouldn't I just do this? Mm -hmm. So if I can eat a meal at a restaurant and it's no different than the place down the road, why wouldn't I just continue to eat at that place that happens to tick all these other boxes? But Joanna, food is a function of identity and, and identifying as a vegan can be a political act and therefore uh, politics is often binary and it's in opposition mm. to something else. So when food becomes cent central to your identity, how hard is it to have a conversation with other people about well, it can, well th there's no doubt that it can, and we sort of see this, um, and, and this is unusual. This is, this is kind of, this degree of choice that there is over what kind of a diet you want to follow is, is pretty new in the history of humankind. You know, I have a brother who lives in Africa. The, the women that work in the vegetable uh, factories uh, in, in his business that he used to work in, you know, they feed their families the foods that are around them. And actually, they're largely plant-based because meat is more expensive and meat is prized, as you said. And so that's a sort of treat that they can afford to throw in every now and again. And that I'm using their language, um, not mine. Um, and, and so they, they don't have a choice as to what, they don't get to have one person who decides in the family, I'm going to follow this kind of diet, I'm going to be vegan and I'm going to be paleo and I'm going gluten free and I'm going this and I'm going that. So in, in, in our modern societies, we do have this sudden sort of, and often it is kind of like this tribal, but I liked, um, I, I liked the comment though about there are often more similarities than there are differences, you know, and even if you look at seemingly two ends of the spectrum from paleo to, to vegan, Actually, there's even similarities there, mm -hmm. you know, that, that if, if you're um, eating both of those diets well and in the right way, then actually it's including lots of plant foods, it's not including junk foods, it's cutting out those ultra processed foods. Um, and it's just that the vegans will choose to add beans or lentils or whatever to their dish and their wild greens and so on, and the paleos are adding their grass fed beef. So there's, you know, there's, so there's, uh, or the wild salmon. So there, there are similarities, I think, across a lot of these. The other thing that I find um, 
kind of concerning though where I am in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, and I'm sure it's the same down in Melbourne, there is this rise of, of what is now being technically called orthorexia. And, the, and, and so I'm moving away here from ethics and the moral choices of eating, but down to the sort of psychology of, of people being so obsessive about their food choices, whatever those food choices are, that it actually starts impeding on the rest of their lives. And, and that's pretty boring to be around. It makes it difficult to have those social aspects of food. It makes it difficult for them to eat, to just be able to go to, and I was brought up, I'm from the country in Scotland and my background is farming and my, on both sides of the family, although not my direct parents, you know, and for me to go to someone's house and not eat what is made for me um, is, 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 is perhaps I'm back in culture here, but, but you know, that's rude. That's rude not to eat what someone has pre lovingly prepared and put, put love into cr creating a meal for you. So I'm sort of brought up in that you eat what's put in the plate in front of you context. And, and so sometimes all of this does feel a little bit like, oh, it's, you know, it is all a luxury of choice. You've met my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, on, on that, on, on identity, Francis, um, I think there's also a lot of gender politics around yeah. it as well. Um, uh, there is a myth about uh, the man as hunter, and I'll talk about meat and being a male thing and, and vegetables being as being a female thing. Um, uh, like there, there is this idea that men go out and, and hunt animals. And if anyone here has ever hunted an animal, to uh, hunt an animal, you have to, and, and be a, a good hunter, you have to understand that animal. If you ever watched an Aboriginal kangaroo dance, for example, they can do the kangaroo dance because they become that animal because they've watched it so many times over and over and again and to do that that does not come without empathy for understanding mm -hmm. that animal when you become that animal uh you it becomes you as well and so in that identity so in that hunter identity there is an amazing amount of of, of uh, empathy and when you when you take an animal's life and I, I've, I've hunted myself as on the farm there is a moment where you go I've taken your life and you then have a moment of grief on it. People who eat burgers and bacon, I've seen these American television shows where these big guys who are bigger than me, um, they get up there and they just put lots of minced meat and bacon in their faces and they make a television show out of it. There is no connection between the animal that was and that's now going to be, become part of them and it's it's death and and animal food food animals as food without any responsibility any responsibility whatsoever to the animal to the farmer to the whole process involved to even the person who's killed that animal like you go to an abattoir's there's a lot of guys in abattoir's who are taking a lot of alcohol and crystal meth to get through the day i assure you of that we are eating meat without responsibility. And that's what, what I find and, and in, the, in this hyper, hyper masculinized world. It's, it's quite bizarre. Uh, food there, as you say, produced in the food industrial complex, specifically designed, Matthew, and, and Mo and everyone on the panel, to keep us at arm's length from the, the right. consequences of our consumption. Can I raise a problem about yeah. this, though? That I think anybody, if you actually spoke to them, is going to agree that they want the idea of the, the animals that they're eating and the plants that they're eating. You know, they want the idea of beautiful farms with the mm. crops growing and happy animals out on the pasture. You know, we've seen a major shift here in Australia where I was just talking the other day um, about eggs. And I was asked to do a segment on eggs and we've had a major shift away from cage eggs. And that is from people's recognizing responsibility that they have towards animal welfare. But we've got this other problem that we have a mass explosion in world population. Mm -hmm. By 2050, you know, people working, scientists working at this level are saying, how are we going to feed everybody? Mm -hmm. I've been evaluating an egg replacement product because, you know, scientists are working on how can we create, how are we going to feed everybody? Mm -hmm. How are we going to get everybody the right nutrients that they need, including things like protein? So we've, we've got this problem between our idea of wonderful, lovely, organic farms with, you know, Daisy the cow and, and going out and milking by hand and, and having our crops. That sort of level of farming can feed your local community, but it can't feed the world. So, so we've got that dilemma on how are we going to do it? But I, I think that there's something really fundamentally missing with it, that why are we then not eating the crops that we're feeding to the animals if they contain right. the same amount of protein? It just okay. doesn't make any sense. If we're literally using all of the resources to cover the land in crops that are then going to, t to feed animals that feed us, I mean, there's all these facts, you know, a one pound burger, oh, kilos, burger, pounds, American, uh, <laughs> you know, and then 
the the pounds and pounds of grain that could just mm -hmm. then feed us. It's just it's a basic math equation. And yes, overpopulation is an issue. And I fully support all those scientists making meat in labs. So that mm. that is an alternative. And you know, Matthew mentioned Impossible Foods. That you have Bill Gates, some of the biggest most wealthy, most influential people in the world backing these plant-based alternatives, there's something there. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking about the resources that are vastly dwindling. They're and, and the environmental impact of actually it. changing the, the, uh, the economy of food production. But the food industrial complex will get hold of it and mm -hmm. big companies will get hold of it. What are the dangers are. and what, what are the threats and the dangers to increasing plant-based uh, uh, diets and, and companies producing this food so that they don't mm -hmm. be also become as in environmentally damaging or as, or as, as co-opted in the way that, that uh, the contemporary or the traditional food production chain is? Mm. That's, that's an interesting question. Before I answer that, just to piggyback a bit on what Mo has said here, so 100% doubling down on what she said there about the efficiencies of plant-based versus animal-based agriculture. And this isn't a new argument. So back in 2006 and 2010, the United States Food and Agriculture Organization released reports where they were encouraging a global shift towards more plant-based diets in order to support the growing population because of the massive inefficiencies of feeding crops that could be eaten to humans to animals and then eating them. I think the going figure is about 12 pounds of grain to one pound of beef ish. Uh, depends on exactly the system that's being used, but uh, massive inefficiencies that it, you could feed people much more easily just with the direct plant products. The exceptions being in areas where you can't really grow crops, where you could graze animals, but you couldn't really grow things for humans, then it's a bit of a different scenario. But all these places where crops are being grown that could be eaten by humans, yeah, just use those and get people to cut back on their meat consumption and replace it with plant proteins. Uh, but in terms of how to stop that from getting sort of perverted by financial incentives. You'd have to ask an economist for that, I guess, but... I think that's inevitable. Yeah, I mean, try and mitigate as much as you can, try and keep things transparent, have people keep staying involved and knowing where their food is coming from. As much as possible, support your local farmers, go to the farmers markets if you can, get a sense of where your food is being sold. Because Richard, from. And I, we, we spoke about this, this is an issue, isn't it? So if we move to a, 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 um, an increasingly plant-based production cycle, doesn't mean that somehow it inevitably leads to better environmental outcomes, or doesn't necessarily mean that it's not taken by, over by big corporate, indu the industrial food complex, and, and create a whole new set of problems in the, in the meantime. Uh, if we were, I'm sorry, if we were to eat, um, if we were to eat the, the food that's fed to animals in an industrial food system, um, do you want to eat GM cotton trash? Do you want to eat uh, GM corn? and GM soy. Um, people are. People are. I don't want to, though. I, I, I really don't think... I think just the, the sheer number of people will... Um, will is, giving, is creating an impetus for, to create monoculture, monoculture crops uh, and really basic diets where the reality of the situation is to, if we want to be healthy. And these are the, these are the pressures on, on going towards more... Why we are going towards plant-based diet is because it's healthier for you uh, it's better for the environment, and but its thing is, if you need to do it in such a way where you're re where you're capturing carbon, where mm -hmm. you're actually increasing soil biodiversity, mm -hmm. you're actually creating creating better phytonutrients, better yep. quality food that's better for you, and that's and uh, different types of plants that are that, that are going to help you, um, which is converging with the other thing that we're learning about is gut health, which you'll probably want to jump on as well. Mm -hmm. All this is feeding, all these different streams are feeding into it's really, really strong indicators that we do need to have more plant-based diet, but it has to be done in such a way that it's actually going to be regenerative agriculture mm -hmm. as opposed to depletive agriculture. Uh, monocultures are bad. Uh, polycultures are good. And I think, and even to answer the question, I know we're running out of time for this session, but this goes back to answering the question about talking about the... Uh, binary nature of meat versus vegan that's stupid question we shouldn't even be talking about that it's but that's where we are yeah no we should talk about the middle ground we should be talking about, i would even use the word meat i wouldn't use the word vegan i said what are the problems facing us health nature environment culture and brain health and how can we solve those through through um, nutrition and diet and the answer will be plant-based uh, because I've looked at the way that the raw milk argument has, has stuffed up cheese production in Australia because everyone's talking about raw milk, everyone's talking about um, 
and talking about, about processed milk, it was a binary discussion, two different camps. It wasn't until they came up in the middle and said, we want to make really, really, really good product that is really ethical on many, many different levels that the, the, the game changed. As soon as we change the question, that'll help the, the, the narrative push um, up a, a different answer to the question. I, I just want to throw in a little... I feel like I'm the spanner in the works up here. That's great. <laughs> we love but a spanner in the I'm works. Just, I'm just going to throw the spanners in here. Um, one, I'm going to question the whole idea of this automatic assumption that a vegan diet is necessarily he more healthy. We know that plant-rich diets are healthy. So I like this idea of coming into the middle ground, which is usually where I find myself. Um, plant-rich diets are undoubtedly helpful uh, and, and are, are indicative of really good health. And so we look at things like the Mediterranean diet that these guys down here at the front or of, of being at the forefront of research. You know, those kinds of diets are, are incredibly rich. When we look at the blue zones around the world, um, where people live the longest and they live the longest, healthier lives, they are plant-rich diets. That is the commonality amongst these diets. But the idea that, well, eating, you know, seafood and, and meat and dairy and so on is somehow a less healthful diet, I, I, I really question that. So I'm, so I'm putting that into play too. You can have a really healthy vegan diet, you can have a really healthy omnivorous diet. The, the balancing between the two of them is the, is the fact that they are plant rich. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is that if we go along this idea of, well, we, we have to you know, eliminate animal foods, we have to have entirely plant-based foods, you know, I, I want to also question the environmental impact. The one thing I have learned, and I have tried to look at the environmental or the climate um, footprint, if you like, of our food choices, that's a really big area of interest for me, is that the assumption that because, you know, our great scientists are coming up with these plant-based alternatives is necessarily less of a carbon footprint is not always correct. If we're talking about something that is ultra-processed in a factory to simulate meat, mm -hmm. it, is that really less of a climate um, uh, footprint? Then, then you know, having a better ethical. Why can't we improve mm -hmm. animal husbandry so that we can somehow meet in the middle, so that those of us that choose to eat meat can actually do so, knowing that the animal was better treated and was killed in a more humane way? So I don't know. I, ju I just think sometimes we can't jump to these assumptions. And actually, Matthew, you said it. I know that um, some of the work I've done with meat and livestock in Australia mm -hmm. here, they've made that exact same point that in large areas of Australia, it is better for climate change. Uh, uh, effects or environmental effects to have cattle or, or other animals actually we should be eating more kangaroos here in Australia but then Australians get up in arms about you know uh, uh, killing our national animal these are wild animals so so we've got all of these really key problems that that are, are never you know when we look on the surface it's really simple to say these things and when you look under the surface it's always much much more complex and the the uh, challenge thrown up by changing the, the uh, food production cycle, for instance, in, say, in the Midwest of America or even in the Northern Territory where the cattle industry is fundamental to the mm -hmm. underpinning of the economy, right. to ask people to make that shift is going to be extremely difficult. We're seeing it now when we're trying to, you know, devolve from or, you know, to uncouple ourselves from a carbon-based right. economy. And that will be played out again, would it not, if we were trying to move further and further towards a plant-based diet and, and saying to people that the production of you know, animal mm -hmm. products is, is not the go for communities whose entire yeah, economies are based on it. So how do we get through that? I know, Mo, simple question. But <laughs> so, so simple. Uh, I think it has to be the change in industry, I know. But it's, it, I, I believe in this ideal world, but logistically the world is not ideal anymore. There's not enough land, so you can't increase animal husbandry to those standards because the only way that that can exist is for those upper echelons and people that are in upper class that can afford those meats where they know their animals names and what they ate for dinner i just think that we're in a place in the world and it's not doom and gloom i think we're in a place in the world that it just can't exist yes the focus would be great but there's as you said earlier, too much money invested in the big business and all that money is going into these animal practices so Look, I think if you tell the Northern Territories that they can't raise their cows, that's devastating, but it's already happening in the price wars. I mean, I was on a panel about the Australian dairy industry, mm -hmm. and these farmers were devastated because milk had gone to a, you know, a dollar a liter, and that everyone's going out. And that's the dairy industry cannibalizing each other because it just can't exist logistically anymore. It, and that's where we're at. 
I think, is, it, is it going to be a case that the way that this will be won will simply be at the price point, supply and demand, the more people who choose to live increasingly plant-based diets are going to force that change by their consumer choices? I mean, it's hard to predict any one definite outcome, but consumers care a lot about price, they care a lot about convenience. And, you know, if other products are coming onto the market that are affordable, that are more sustainable, they're probably going to go for those as long as they taste good. Yeah, uh, selfish. People are selfish. They, they want are. things that taste good. And the only way that'll drive a lot of these people's hands and make these decisions is if it really doesn't cause any sort of difference between what they had before. I agree. Soy proteins are is the worst in terms of food miles and in the environment. But if that's the thing that's going to get Uncle Tony to stop eating a steak, then that's going to create a better change in the long term. You changed your food culture, Richard, when you went meatless for a year. What do you, if you sort of like now reflect back on that time? What were the fundamental things that changed for you as a person in that time? Mates at the barbecue would um, push me to the outer edge um, as oh. I cooked my lentil, bur lentil burgers. But the funny enough, the kids, my children and their friends would eat the lentil burgers over the meat to begin with because I knew how to make, because um, um, having learned how to use um, legumes and how to blend it and, and, and get the right texture and the right amount of moisture, they liked them above the other dry, their, let's say they're their crap burgers. And so that was um, one thing, um, ostracisation, first to begin with, because I was, I, I was a high-profile meat eater. I admit that now. And, um, <laughs> you know, I had to go through, I wouldn't eat that, I wouldn't, I, when I went to Spain, there was a joke that I had to have a hamon patch on my arm, you know, because I couldn't eat, eat the stuff. Now, um, so for me, for me, Francis, what it was is actually by removing that, um, that crutch of of animal protein in understanding and cooking and every and every and everything I thought about food, I then was trying to instead of trying to find the food narrative, uh, uh, the meat narrative, I was trying to find the vegetarian narrative. And it then, when you pull meat out of the way you see the world, the vegetarian, almost vegan world appeared. And I realised now I was working in in Mexico. I'm like, my God, the Aztecs actually built all this civilization you know they had a, a, they had pyramids they had lakes they had uh, aquaculture they had the most amazing civilization before um uh, Velasco, before the um, spanish arrived and that was all based on the three sisters that was based on corn yes, curky squash. boots like uh, squash and legumes and everywhere you go, all those great civilizations, the Romans, they existed on barley and fava beans. And yeah, they're, they're, that was basically a plant-based way of, of, of ruling the world. And they'd, what they do, they'd actually get rabbits and send them out in, in front of their frontier. So they always had something, to, some little bit of pro, animal protein to nibble on. But you look at India's, India's great civilizations were based on, on legumes and rice. And so it's always the, 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 the great cultures around like even the aboriginal culture that's been based on um on um uh on panicum uh grain grasses and and legumes such as as wattle seed you know they, they every it turns up every time and time again grain and legume side by side and that was like taking to the next paleo summit richard <laughs> <laughs> and, um, the paleo researchers will tell you that the minute we started eating grains our stature dropped our health decreased you know, yeah. we're, we're, so we've, we've also got this really big problem. I'm not saying that's right, by the way, but I'm just saying <laughs> we also have this big problem that people are really confused about what is a healthy diet anymore. Mm -hmm. So you've got the people who are anti-grain. If you're anti-grain and anti-legume, you can't be a vegan. So, you know, what are you left yeah. to eat if you're not going to eat any animal product, product and you're not going to eat any of these grains or legumes? So this is also what is confusing people is what is healthy. Um, well, this is this is just what uh, this is the way that the world works. Is that people eat grains and legumes side by side, and it forms a huge part of the global diet. No, yeah, not always. Yeah. Okay, we could keep going, but I think we're, <laughs> we, we have to throw the question uh, over to you now. Uh, we do have some microphones either side of the stage, so stick your hand in the air uh, so we can find you. We're going to get start right up the back, uh, start at the back, and work our way down. One one. Yes. Yeah, Hi, I'm Delan Fernando from Young Voices for Animals. Um, Richard, I wanted to sort of dig into something you said earlier on in uh, at the start of the panel. So I've been doing a lot of thinking around sort of 
what the end goal of veganism is and what the end goal of the vegan movement is in general. And you talked about this idea, I suppose, of your vision of a, f I guess, food utopia. You talked about this future where you want to go back to a state where, um, where you know, you can raise an animal on a farm and take care of them and, uh, and then eventually when they're not looking, you'd kill them. And I sort of appreciate where you're coming from here because we clearly have share this value of, you know, we want a world that respects animals. We Can want you a world ask that a question? loves animals. Move, move to the question, sir, because we've got, yeah, we got sorry. plenty of other questions around. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that really, like, why does your model of utopia stop there? Like, is that really a vision of respect and love that we want to model around where we sort of kill those we love when they're not looking? You know, why not envision a world that moves forward and sees animals as individuals rather than commodities? Uh, yeah, clap if you like. Yep, clap. Um, yeah, um, how can I start? I did not love that cow. <laughs> Next. So, you, so, but it's interesting. You, you're saying that there's a different uh, relationship to that process to, to what the gentleman has. What's your name again? Delana. Delana. We were poor, we are hungry. My dad died when we were eight. We had to feed ourselves. So we killed the animal, we ate it to feed the family. I'm sorry if that, if sorry, but we didn't love that animal. I didn't know that animal, it didn't have a name. We shot it, we ate it, we fed our family. We are farmers, we respect everything on the farm because if you, sorry Francis. No, it's okay. If you do not respect an animal, it won't taste good. If you don't look after it, you won't get a, you won't get, oh, you look, okay, we can laugh at, you can laugh at me now. I'm trying to offer, a, I'm trying to be honest and respectful. Do you want that? Or do you want me to lie and tell you something? I'm giving you an honest emotional response. You, as if you do not look after an animal, you will not taste good. It will not give you great production. It is pointless. If it's pointless not looking after an animal, that's not what animal husbandry is about. So, yeah, we respect animals, but I did not love it, and they're your words, mate, not mine. Okay, we've got some more questions. My name's Jamie Pierce. Uh, I once, long, long ago, worked in an abattoir, and I fully appreciate the aesthetics and the empathy of refusing meat. I fully understand that. Um, what I, and I imagine this is a, a question an awful lot of vegans get, but what's the problem with honey? I really don't understand the problem with honey. And if you can extend that, perhaps milk. I mean, cheese is uh, contented cows, you know, and uh, and free range chick chooks. Uh, what's really the problem? Well, it's that's. I mean, I think you should talk about statistics with bees and honey, but I, I would just as soon have people uh, cut out their cheese and dairy than meat if that's the first way they go because animals are kept alive and tortured. Yes, free range, but free range also isn't always free. But the way that eggs and dairy are produced, it's, it's much worse, much, much worse. I, I, I actually have an issue with this whole dairy as always, because when we see these images on television about dairy farming, they always show the absolute worst in them. And I've got no doubt some of those things really do go on and that's dreadful. I think all of us would feel awful about that. But um, my family, my cousin runs one of the biggest dairy farms in Scotland and I've visited that farm all my life, ever since I was young. I grew up next to a very small dairy farm where the cows were all pretty much still um, hand, hand milked. When I go to my cousin's farm, the cows are not tortured. Nobody's tortured. The cow, the, 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 there's actually a robotic milking machine. They voluntarily go in there to be milked. They get a little massage while yeah. they're there. Sorry? Um, You're putting an emotional response onto, onto that. I'm a mother too. To answer, I'm a mother too. I'm just seeing this, this sort of emotional, they're tortured and but they're, 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 I don't know, that's not the view that I see when I visit a, a dairy, a dairy norm. farm. That's your family's farm, that's not the norm of what you're buying. It's the biggest dairy farm in Scotland. It is the norm in dairy farming. The, the, the norm is not, is not the images that you see on, on the internet about dairy farming. 
ask you, have you, Madam, if you've got a question, you can put your hand in the air and ask it when, when it's your turn. Uh, we've got some well, another question Sorry, down the floor. Can I just please? finish yep. that question? While we're, getting the, while we're getting the microphone down, yep. because it's, yeah. Yep. So just to the honey question is the honey one. I'm not up on the statistics, that. honestly, but just to answer what a lot of the common concerns in the literature are about why people object to the dairy industry is what I've been hearing from the audience that a lot of people object to the fact that in many farms the cows have their babies taken away at a pretty darn early age, usually a day or two after birth, and then if they're male, well, they have a particular fate in store, and if they're female then yeah, they're often raised for dairy consumption, but a lot of the concern is around what happens to the babies, because cows only produce milk because they've given birth to then, you know, feed their babies. So that is one part of the um, concerns around that. As well treated as the cows may be after the fact, still there's the question of what's happening to the babies. So an ethical so. decision made around the production process. Right. Uh, I've got a question just over here from, thank you. Hi, my name's Brooke. I'd just like to get all of your perspectives on human consumption of sea minerals like magnesium and stuff from astaxanthin and spirulina. Um, do you see it as a viable option for the future with our population growth? Yes. Any <laughs> ideas? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I think there is, uh, there is enormous interest in getting more of our nutrients from the sea in general, uh, from seaweed as well as from, from algae. Absolutely, there is. It's just a matter of, well, how do we get that into, f you know, it's not, these are not foods that most people are eating much of. Um, you know, seaweed is, is also one of the, I, I heard, uh, was lucky enough to be on the stage with Professor Tim Flannery at our Australian Lifestyle Medicine Conference. He was talking about how seaweed is, is fantastic as a carbon sink. We've got far more sea area than we do land. And so there's enormous interest in, in using the sea much more for food production. Um, and when you look at the gut, you know, this is also just part of culture. Actually, this is just a little thing of interest. The Japanese actually have particular microorganisms in their gut that helps them to break down seaweed that most of us lack because we don't have that food as part of our diet. So look, I, def I think you're right. We, we will certainly go down, down that avenue. There's also great interest in eating more insects for protein. You know, other uh, for a lot of people, it's, it's much more ethically acceptable to be eating insects. Um, How do you grosses other people out. So, yeah, you know, we're, so it's we're breaking those cultural barriers it's, it's and those taboos, isn't it? It's absolutely breaking those cultural barriers down. One of the, one of the uh, best um, uh, restaurants in Spain uh, called um, Aponiente. There's a chef there called Angel Leon, and he in the town called the Puerta de Maria in near Cadiz, and he's been working with the Cadiz uh, University, and they make um, a really concentrated uh, product from uh, phytoplankton, and it is just absolutely delicious because he's saying, well, the Mediterranean's run out of fish. We fish that dry. Let's go and grow this. Let's go and uh, grow this phytoplankton and get the uh, get the benefits of that and it is so delicious it is just and they mix it with rice it's just this really really lovely dish so i'm going to tie it into both purple jumper and brooke's question sorry i don't remember your name <laughs> but i think that as long as it's done in balance and we're not over using any of these resources so that's the argument with honey it's overusing these resources and and they're offsetting the environment and causing a, a huge disruption. It's the butterfly effect, but it's a bee effect. So uh, I think especially with the resources in the ocean. But is abstinence to honey in making that conscious decision, is that the only choice for somebody who has that ethical position or is there a way that no, you can... No, there's, there's honey vegans, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's hard to see. I'm trying to... Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Good um, question. And then we'll come to, to the middle of the row. Sorry. Okay. Um, my name's Selena. I'm from Latrobe University. I'm a student there. Um, I, Joanna, you mentioned that a lot of teenage girls, or just teenagers in general, uh, have anemia while being vegan. My question is for Mo and Matthew. Um, <laughs> pardon. Um, my question is... What nutrient besides iron have you found the most difficult to replace in your diet or just uh, account for in terms of RDI? I'm just going to stand up and show you that I am not lacking in absolutely anything <laughs> at all. All right? Just saying that right now. Um, I've never had any issues with health. I know that it exists, and I think it comes purely from the fact that it's not about cutting anything out. It's about achieving balance in your diet. So if you're choosing to not eat meat 
and you're lacking in iron or B12, there's supplements to take, there's alternative resources to get these. I'm not, I have never had any health issues, touch wood, but I think that, you know, it's, it's each human is different and, th you know, there's different diseases and conditions that run in your family and you just have to be mindful of them when you're making choices, whether that's abstaining from meat or abstaining from vegetables full stop. There's vegans that only eat hot chips and Lord of the Fries. I, I mean, that, they're the ones really doing the, the bad image for veganism because, yes, you can be a very unhealthy vegan. You can also be a very mindful eater. That, and maybe that's what it should be called. But I think achieving the balance is where you're going to not see lack in anything. Yeah, so thank you for that question and, and for your response. That's most of what I was going to say. Um, that yes, if you're doing a vegan diet, you do want to be very mindful to plan it well, to have a good, balanced, varied diet. Lots of junk food is vegan. I mean, lots of biscuits are vegan, chips are vegan, Lord of the Fries, as delicious as it is, you probably shouldn't be eating that every day. Um, and B12 is the one where you, you just, there isn't a reliable plant-based source of that, so you should be supplementing from that. Uh, but with proper planning, it is indeed very attainable, and both the Canadian and the American Dietetic Associations have official statements saying that a well-planned, focus on the well-planned, vegan diet is nutritionally adequate. So as long as you're being mindful about what you're eating, um, so what you're saying is a conscious choice to live a, a, a plant-based diet also comes with the responsibility mm -hmm. to curate that properly. Yes, because... Like any diet. Yeah. You should be responsible to curate your diet of anything you eat. Yeah, but for most of us, we're not. I mean, most people don't. I think most people eat what's available to them. And I think that's a really interesting thing. That's that This whole it. conversation is about a conscious decision on the kind of diet you are, ha you are going to to make part of a very central part of your life because the resources and time required to actually get it right are quite significant. Most people don't spend that much time, and I think it's reflected in the obesity statistics and the health of the nation. Most people don't spend that much time curating their diet. And it's a, it's a, a complete, what we're asking here, from what I can see, is a complete shift in people's thinking about what priority they put on their diet. And that is, I think, a really interesting discussion that probably should be had at another time. But that's what we're asking people to do. Which I think comes back to the middle ground that we've been mentioning so much. The fact that, was it 7% of Aussies are, are eating the right amount of veggies? So I think in general, people, regardless of where you are on the spectrum, really should be giving some more thought and deliberation to what we're putting into our bodies and being more mindful and conscious eaters, whether you're vegan or not. I think we should get to some more questions and then we'll yeah, come. Sure. Uh, hello, my name's Liam Davies. Um, there was a throwaway comment about why vegans want to eat meat-looking products. I was wondering if we could have a little discussion about why vegans would eat meat-like products. I might have used it because... Mm, I think you kind of answered that. Yeah. Not the taste of meat, but not the... Yeah, because people don't want to give up the taste or mm -hmm. the feeling or the food mm -hmm. memories or mm -hmm. the experience of sitting at their grandma's table. Yeah. If that's not why they're doing it. So if, they, I mean, it's purely taste. So why am I taking away this thing that I love so much and not replacing it with something that I could also equally as love or love more? Um, I, th I think that's it. I, I think the only other comment I have is why are meat eaters so defensive that meat is theirs? <laughs> How do you, you know? mean? How do you experience that? Why can we have like what I would say is a pretty damn good Reuben and it's not made from pastrami, it's made from soy and gluten and uh, you know other alternatives. But why are meat eaters so up in arms that we call it pastrami? I have no idea. <laughs> it's, it's not a yours or mine situation. Mm -hmm. that, that's maybe it. I, I'm not sure if I have anything else to say about it. I just, uh, I just, a lot of those products, we did a taste test recently with um, Fairfax, looking at those products, and some of them are pretty good, but similitudes of meat, but some of them I really feel like um, there's a captive audience that's been exploited by people who do not really know either food science, food mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. or, or actually even understand taste, because <laughs> some of them are absolutely, look, some of them, look, yeah. they look like, they feel mm -hmm. like they're being totally. printed by a computer, and instead of typing in meat, they've typed in thong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really dirty thong. Yeah. Food. It's, it's shocking that they're allowed to be produced, really. 
and on in mainstream grocery stores. Yeah. That you know those are the products that are doing a disservice to the vegan argument, the plant-based diet, because there's a lot of really amazing alternatives, mm -hmm. and even people in Australia making really great alternatives, but they'll never have the platform because of funds. So, mm -hmm. I think looking at the rise in these really amazing burgers shows you the sign of the future that there are going to be a lot of really great alternatives mm -hmm. coming. And if that, honestly, I keep saying this e example of like really captivating that one extremely carnivorous person in your life, but if that burger is what does it, then that's what does it. And I think that, you know, that person might always have those burgers because they don't want to give up that steak with their mates at the barbecue. They don't want to have that feeling of isolation or alienation. But if, if there is a product out there that is called meat, but it isn't meat, and if that's what does it for you, then that's achieving the end goal of more mindful eating, uh, greater contribution to the environment and animals and ethics and everything. Okay. But, but even though but some of them are, some are really, really crap. And oh, some yeah. of them are really packed with E numbers, and and they've got four different four different gums in them that are probably not doing your, your gut health terribly well, mm -hmm. and they've got um, all these different compounds in them that are that are tricking your. But this goes to my point earlier about the food industrial complex co-opting mm -hmm. the the plant-based diet approach to life. How do we guard against that? Because if we're replacing one production cycle with problems with another with a different set of problems. What's the point? This is kind of what I was getting at when I said I don't understand the idea of trying to create a burger that bleeds, uh, you know, but it's but it's vegan. I, I do fear that, you know, regardless of what diet you follow, the, the essence of making that diet a healthy diet has to be to eat whole, minimally processed foods. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we know to feed the human race really, really well. And so I just don't get it. To, I, well, I get it from an animal welfare perspective and, I, mm -hmm. to, you know, hat, hats off. I, I, I completely understand the ethics involved in that. But to then just go down another ultra processed route mm -hmm. to me is just crazy then it's no longer about health but where's the finances where's the end goal in having farms that produce vegetables it's just not there there's no there is absolutely no in financial incentive for these big industries to then all of a sudden grow carrots again so the critical mass of demand will be the only thing that changes that and we're back with a market-based approach to things which will always <laughs> reduce things down to the easy, most easily produced, cheapest products. So it's, um, it's a difficult fight. But I mean, just, just to quickly jump on that. So I, I share the concern about this hyper-processed food, whether mm -hmm. it's vegan or not. And what I'm most excited about is the new products that are plant-based but aren't that hyper-processed. So they have a small number of recognizable plant-based ingredients that still mimic things that we like like this new product from Just Incorporated that's the Just Scramble that's made from mung beans and not a whole lot else. And it tastes a lot like scrambled eggs. Uh, you can also do a similar thing with like a chickpea flour and a bit of black salt that mimics things. There's a lot of relatively minimal, not super processed plant-based analogs that are hitting the market more and more. And that's where I think most of the promise is so that you're getting around that hyper-processed or tasting like crap stuff and not just replacing one ultra processed thing with another. And that's the most exciting thing part of the, uh, the food industry is going to happen at present as meat becomes more and more expensive and people are turning away from it for ethics, for health reasons, etc, etc. <laughs> You're going to see a lot more plant protein being brought into the diet in processed yeah. food but also yeah. hopefully just well cooked by people who understand how to cook properly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, because mm. <laughs> we should go up the back, there's another question for us. Hi, Serena Grasso is my name and I'm a Latrobe graduate in ergonomic safety and health. So, of course, health is a big thing for me. Um, but also personally, um, my late father was diagnosed with cancer some years ago. So we did a lot of reading and we did a lot of research. Um, and we learned that some um, communities in North America that had vegetarian, not vegan, vegetarian diets had a lower rate of cancer. Do you, do you have any more information about that? Is there any more research about that? Can you comment on that, please? Joanna. Yeah, well, well, the first thing to, to say is that that doesn't necessarily mean that a vegetarian diet reduces your risk of cancer. That's, pr that's indicative of a plant-rich diet reduces your risk of cancer. So even when we look at, you know, the data showing, oh, well, red meat, red meat consumption being associated with colon cancer, for example, is that the red meat that's causing this? Or is it the fact that people who are big red meat eaters don't eat enough vegetables? They don't eat enough plant food? So, so what you have to be careful with when you do internet searches on nutrition research 
is that it is always much more complex. When you change one thing in a diet, there's always something else that changes with it. So it's always much more complex than just looking. When we look at those big kind of association studies, they're called epidemiological studies, you're looking at associations, you're not looking at cause and effect. So we start with those big epidemiological studies and we go, oh, what is it about that? What do you think it was about those people that meant they get less cancer? And then researchers dig down. And then until you get to the stage where, you know, the sort of gold standard is then to be able to do what's called a randomized controlled mm -hmm. trial where you can get people. But the trouble with that when we look at diet research is it's very difficult with diseases that take a long time to develop. If I said to you guys, right, I'm putting you in a diet and you're going to be on it for the next 40 years, okay? And you guys are going to be on a different diet for 40 years. And That's I'm why we invited you here tonight. <laughs> Let's just say the kicker to the end there. Yeah, those kind of studies just are, are just uh, you know few and far between and really pretty impossible to do. So so that's the job of nutrition researchers. That's what's so difficult um, about doing those kind of, of research. But what, what is absolutely apparent is that um, for, for all chronic diseases, including cancer, certainly plant-rich diets seem to be very protective on, on because of all the phytochemicals, things like antioxidants and so on that they provide. Those things seem to be very, very good. And they're certainly very good for your gut health, that's got a knock-on effect on your overall physical and mental health. Uh, I've got a question from Facebook for you, Richard. I think this is pertinent to you. you, you we discussed earlier skipping, uh, you know, uh, cows and, and just uh, eating crops, but that normally uh, that normally feed them. That was one of the things we talked about, and it's not as practical as, as we might have thought. But you know, it does ask if that shift in in production for food uh, actually occurred in some way. Uh, did, does that present a whole new range of issues for sustainable uh, soil quality and crop rotation and regeneration? If we put more pressure on the land to, to grow more for us in that regard, would that be is that a whole new set of problems for us? Uh, challenges because you have to know if you're going to um, move away from monocultures and move into polycultures, you do actually have to understand um, you do actually understand soil ro yeah, rotations, uh, crop rotation. You have to understand the way that the, the different species interact with each other, the different food, you know, the different plant, uh, not kingdom, uh, the different plant, like the way grasses will react to legumes and, and mm -hmm. to react to curcubutes, etc. They all have a different relationship with each other. So it does require uh, knowledge. So you're not using the soil as a substrate and just applying um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and potassium to it. You're actually um, doing regenerative soil, um, regenerative farming to, to increase the uh, biomass in the soil. Yeah, that takes knowledge and that takes understanding. Um, but you then the, 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 um, you do get better food. You get less salt, you get less um, nitrogen in your water system, uh, you, and you get um, basically get a, a lot more nutrient in the food, and so and flavour in the food. So that's you know, are we doing a large scale? No, that's not going to happen on a large scale. I don't see it happening on a large scale. The, the, but the more it happens, and the more we consume it, we're sending um, something. We're sending messages to the market to do more of it. So eat, do more of it. Eat more vegetables. Okay. Um. I see lots of hands in the air now. Uh, where's the microphone? That's a good question. I think we've got a question from uh, somebody in a hat. A woman in a hat. He's got a very lovely black hat on from what I can, what I can barely see. I can see the black hat, but I can't see you. Hi, uh, my name's Caitlin. I'll try and just okay, very quickly um, give the background to my question. Um, we touched on the idea that we have a bit of a nostalgic fantasy these days about what farming actually looks like, particularly of animals. Um, and I suppose really over, it might be over the last 70 or so years, the way that animals are raised, it's not just slaughtered, but the way they're raised and the way their, their lives exist, the way they're handled um, is very, very, very different from how it looked. Most people couldn't even imagine what it's actually evolved to with very few workers and astronomical numbers of animals, lots of automated processes, animals being moved around by machines. It's it's quite, It can be quite horrific when you're first exposed to these kinds of images and realise that they're widespread. Um, and um, I'm just wondering if there's been any kind of um, investigation into the effect of the trauma of, of becoming uh, aware of this kind of stuff that goes on hidden from view and when you are somebody who's chosen to to look into it and say, hang on, wait, this stuff's going on. I'm going to investigate more what's going on. I don't want to be a part of this. And so you make your personal choice about what you now, for example, going cruelty-free in all sorts of aspects. It might be cosmetics. It might be your diet choices. But then you still have to live in a world where a lot of people aren't aware. A lot of people will be quite dismissive of your choice. Um, and you're reminded constantly of these extremely traumatic images that you've seen. Yeah, I, I have to say, especially being vegan so long, I actually can't 
watch those images anymore. I've been exposed to them. That's what caused me to go vegan. But I, I have to say my greatest sort of strike rate in, and it's not my mission to convert everyone to veganism, okay? I'm not <laughs> secretly out there to get y'all. But I, I think the most positive uh, strike rate would be positivity. So creating these experiences that actually avoid those horrific slaughterhouse images altogether because if someone is turned off, they will be just so turned off. And I, and I highly advocate for all of these animal rights organizations doing all of these campaigns. They're effective. They cause people to change their minds. I was one of those people. But in terms of reaching a greater mass, you have to think about the selfishness of human nature and think about the fact that they don't want to be put in a circumstance that makes them feel confronted or, you know, uh, confronting. Where does your food come from? The fact that you could show them trees being cut down to get their plants, it won't have the same effect. But when you see screaming and bleeding and babies taken away from them, and you know, I think that that's really effective, but it's not how you're gonna convert most people. So that, that's my main goal, is to convert people through their stomachs and show them that plant-based diets are, are really delicious and, and they are effective and that you are fulfilled and Going back to the, you're full, you're happy. There's ways to do it. How are your margaritas at the restaurant, though? The best. There you go. <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I think we have to call it in for now. We are uh, going to be at the front. Uh, there'll be tea and coffee served out there, so a chance to uh, to get together and continue the conversation with each other and with our panelists. Before we say thank you and goodbye, there are a number of upcoming events for the Tro Bold Thinking Series, and also uh, some other great events too, including next uh, Monday, the 30th of April. Australia's uh, journalists. Will working in or on Myanmar. That's happening at La Trobe University yeah. City Campus at 6.30 p.m. So for those interested in that very challenging environment there, uh, that will be a conversation certainly worth attending. Thursday the 3rd of May, uh, how human rights can be extended and defended. A conversation with Julian Triggs and Julian Burnside presented by Ideas and Society. That's happening at Exper Media at the State Library at 6.30 p.m. Thursday the 3rd of May and then we are going to be in Albury on Thursday the 24th of May uh, on the Albury camp campus and this is something I'm really looking forward to because I've just turned 50. Forever young, <laughs> how can we age without getting old? I'm going to be fully tuned in for this one. Uh, a panel discussion uh, about uh, the issue of ageing and, and whether you know we are heading to uh, Dr. Carl always told me, I worked with Dr. Carl for many years, and he always said to me, Francis, by the time you're 70, people will be living to 120. I'm still holding out for that, Carl. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> he still believes it too. And so Dr. Carl believes it. But that, that'll be great. That'll be a great conversation at the Cube in Wodonga, or Wodonga, if you're up that way. Uh, we do have some books for sale at the front too. If you've enjoyed the conversation tonight, certainly uh, Christine Isops' is, is book, I've, I've purchased a couple of her cookbooks. They're fantastic. Um, and uh, she's uh, Joe's book as well, uh, Mo Wise and Richard Cornish, they all have uh, uh, books out there for, for you to enjoy. And Mo very kindly has uh, donated a $50 Smith and a daughter dining voucher. I think the books, uh, I think they're under your chair, in fact. I think what we're going to do, have a look under your chair. If you've got a little oh. gold star, right, you, you might get actually a get a, you might you'll get a car. <laughs> exactly. Get a car. There we go. Oh, yeah. you, you, if you've got a little gold star, um, you get one for oh, nothing. One back there too. Yeah. So, Come down Good the front with your stars. little gold star, oh, your little amazing. golden ticket, and uh, you'll pick up one of the prizes. But uh, the books are on, on sale at the front as well. Thank you for coming to our latest Bold Thinking Series event. Can you please thank our panellists, Richard, Joanna, Mo, Matthew, and to everyone here at the Sofitel. Um, and we'll see you in Wodonga, because of course you'll all be there, because you all want to age gracefully as well. So. I mean, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs>